Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our 30 week Bible study title, The Unexpected King, as the key to unlock the big picture of the Gospel of Matthew. So, if you have your Bibles or BSF app on your devices, please turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses from 4 to 7. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 4 to 7. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat and go home. Then the man got up and went home. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, you are all-powerful God. You heal, restore, and even overcome death. You are the author and the giver of life. Lord, this evening, as a, your word is opened up before us, we pray you continue to speak to us. We pray this in Jesus' magnificent name. Amen. Dear friends, April 7th was the World Health Day. And this year, the motto, Building a Fairer, Healthier World. So, the names of the diseases which you see on the screen are only a very short list of the diseases that affect the mankind. In spite of man's best efforts, Two of the greatest obstacles to human happiness and this flourishing are the twin problems of sickness and death. And so, what a good news it is to know. In today's passage, Jesus shows us his power over these two terrible results of the fall. So, for more results, for more details, let's move into our lesson. So, here is our outline. Jesus' scope of authority, that is the first 17 verses. Second division, Jesus' purpose for authority from verses 18 to 34. Jesus' scope of authority, Jesus' purpose for authority. There are 10 miracles of Jesus recorded in chapter 8 and 9. Among them, we have already looked at the first five miracles. Today, we come to the last of these five miracles of power. Last week, we have seen in chapter 8, Jesus, along with the disciples, visited a Gentile region called Gatherings and heals two demon-possessed men. Now, in our present chapter, verse 1, Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. After being asked by two, after being asked by the town people of gatherings to live by, Jesus climbed into a boat and went back across the lake to his own town, Capernaum, which was a center for his ministry. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. So Jesus comes to Capernaum and this man brings him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith. Jesus acknowledged the faith of the man who bought their friend. This man exercised faith in Jesus' ability to heal and showed concern and took action on behalf of their friend. Take heart, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. When you are paralyzed and lying on a mat, and you have been brought to a healer, and he tells you to take heart, that means something good is coming. But instead, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. At this time, at this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blasphemy. When Jesus declared the man forgiven, the teachers of the law almost had a stroke. The teachers of the law considered 
this is as blasphemy because the old testament clearly teaches us that only god can forgive sin and knowing their thoughts jesus said why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts the teachers of the law accused jesus of blasphemy and jesus accused them of having evil thoughts so who was right if jesus was not god then the pharisees were right if jesus is god then jesus was right so jesus and the teachers of the law are at a standstill which are easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk notice that he does not ask them which is easier to do rather which is easier to say friends it is easier to say your sins are forgiven because no one can tell whether it actually worked it is a internal thing but when you say to a paralytic get up and walk everyone will know whether you have the authority to speak those words or not but <clears throat> i want you to know that <clears throat> the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins <clears throat> sorry this is a second time in the gospel of matthew jesus refers to himself as the son of man so he said to the paralyzed man get up take your mat and go home jesus told the man to take up his mat and go home and that is just what the man did jesus demonstrates his authority to forgive by healing the paralytic when the crowd saw this when the crowd saw this they are filled with awe and the praise god who had been who had given such a authority to man when the crowd saw this they were filled with awe note this is in all this, this is all in response to what they saw but not the forgiving of his sins because you cannot see the forgiveness of sins so what are you supposed to learn friends since forgiveness is a more important need than healing we should be filled with even greater awe and praise for jesus authority to forgive sin next it was the trust of the friends of this man that led to his being brought to christ they believed and acted on that belief he found forgiveness because the friends believed that jesus alone could heal friends is there someone you know who needs a faithful friend to bring them to jesus can you be that friend will you trust christ enough to bring that friend to the one who alone can make them all as jesus went on from there he saw a man named matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth as jesus went on from there went on from where from healing the paralytic what does he do next he saw a man named matthew and where was matthew when jesus called him sitting right there at the collector's booth the first sinner he sees is none other than matthew himself matthew the writer of this gospel also known as levi is writing about himself here he is writing about his own call to follow jesus matthew was an unlikely person for jesus to call because he was a tax collector matthew was a jew working for the romans against his own people and likely stealing from his own people friends does not sound like the kind of person you want on your team and yet jesus still called him follow me he told him and matthew got up and followed him so what does jesus calling of matthew teach us friend jesus calls you as you are but he does not leave you as you are he does not call you to stay where you are 
he calls you while you are still in your sin but he also calls you out of your sin he calls you to follow him he calls you to be his disciple to walk as he walked to live as he lived while jesus was having dinner at matthew's house many tax collectors and sinners came and we ate with him and his disciples matthew does not seem to be concerned about what he lost he wanted to celebrate what he believed and what he has gained he invited all his friends over for a party to meet jesus friends the person who truly understands who jesus is cannot wait to introduce their friends to him matthew not only walked away from his past so he could follow jesus he also worked hard to introduce jesus to his friends matthew was not content to be a private christian he believed in jesus and therefore he wanted all his friends to have the joy of knowing him so two questions two answers why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners so when jesus sat down for meal with tax collectors and the sinners guess what the pharisees asked jesus disciples why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners jesus heard their question and answered them answered their criticism this way on hearing this jesus said it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick jesus is there not to condemn or condone but rather to help and to heal but the pharisees did not get that and so jesus gives them the illustration of the doctor and the sick imagine you are a doctor you have the choice of going down to team a sorry town a or town b in town a everyone is healthy in town b everyone is sick and in need of care and where do you go obviously town b makes sense doesn't it but go and learn what this means when jesus tells the pharisees to go back and study the text more closely maybe they miss something the first time he quoted hosea chapter 6 and verse 6 i desire mercy not sacrifice for i have not come to call the righteous but sinners god told hosea to marry gomer a practicing prostitute to illustrate how the lord god who is by nature faithful loyal merciful and full of compassion for his people israel though they are unfaithful and this was the rebuke aimed at the jewish leaders who strictly upheld external religious practices but did so without a heart for god or people friends you can preach about how much god loves the world but until you show love the words meaning nothing friends he is a penetrating questions for you if you told your friends that you are a true follower that you are a true follower of jesus would they believe you would they be surprised they may know that you go to church but if you told them that you are betting your life on jesus would they laugh or would they ask for more information or would they draw the wrong conclusions about what it means to be a true follower because of your life friends take these cautions to heart and don't let them paralyze you we must find a way to be in the world without embracing the values of the world now the second questions john's disciples came and asked them how is that that we and the pharisees fast often but your disciples do not fast and so here are, here we have two different groups the pharisees 
and the disciples of the John, each fasting for different reasons, but they both had something in common. That is, they were fasting, while Jesus' disciples were not. And John's disciples wanted to know why. Jesus answered, "How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them?" Jesus answered their question with another question in order to make a point. How can the guests of the kingdom? How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The answer is obvious. They cannot. A wedding is a time of feasting and joy. It is a time of celebration. It is a time to gather family and friends. So, what was Jesus saying by all this? Jesus is saying that he is the bridegroom. He is the one that Israel has been waiting for all these years. So, yes, it made sense to fast before. But now that Jesus has come, everything changes. and jesus goes on to say in the rest of the words the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them and then they will fast jesus is speaking here of his death the disciples are rejoicing in his presence now but the day will come when he is taken from them and then they will mourn his absence and then they will fast and here jesus uses two matching illustrations in verses 16 and 17 to make the same point the illustration of the unshrunk cloth and the illustration of the wine skins no one would sew a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment it would not make sense the second illustration when an Old wine skin filled filled it with the new wine. It would burst the wine skin. Imagine if Jesus were giving this illustration today, he would use more modern examples like your spots, your smartphone does not support 4G. You have to replace it with the new. Or he would say you can't change, you can't charge an iPhone 13 with an older cable. You need C type cable. or he would say your present operation system does not support the latest windows 11 if you did your system will crash once again jesus point is exactly the same here the world is incom- incompatible with the new now he finishes by saying in verse 17 No, they poured new wine into new wine skins, and both are preserved. Jesus makes the point that he, with his coming, a new paradigm is established. The gospel does not fit in with the sacrificial system of old. The one true sacrifice has been made. The people of God are no longer confined to one nation or to a physical locality. it is no longer needs a curtain separating man from god we have now gained access it is no longer about trying to live better lives in the hope of gaining god's favor no it is about entering into the grace of our lord jesus christ god is gracious by nature grace is god's favor that he freely extends to the undeserved grace cannot be earned or it would not be a grace human effort does not contribute in any way to the benefits god gives to people everything that god allows in our life exhibits his grace so here is our first principle jesus authority uncovers our desperate need for new life jesus authority uncovers our desperate need for new life so dear brothers in christ god is gracious and generous 
he will not reject you because of your sin through christ you have been set free by the grace that makes you new and that kind of attitude has the power to change the world so dear friend what changes do you need to make in your life what things in your life are incompatible with christ are you resisting christ and resisting the changes he is trying to bring in your life remember resisting christ is like that patch of unshrunk growth tearing at the patterns of the your old life your life needs to change and trying to rest in christ in your in your life is like the old wine skins bursting from the fullness of the new wine but jesus not only wants to free you from your old ways he also wants to lead you into new ways of living friend you need to let god expand your life to fit the new patterns of life he wants to grow in us in other words it is time to leave the world behind because when jesus comes everything changes friend will you let christ change you today let's move to our second division jesus purposes for authority while he was saying this a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said my daughter has just died but come and put your hand on her and she will live yes for the information given by gospel of mark this synagogue leader name was zairus notice the first thing about him is the attitude of the ruler he is both respectful and believing he kneels before jesus come and put your hand on her and she will live and then he is also full of faith his daughter has just died he believes that jesus can raise his daughter with just the touch of his hand hebrew chapter 11 says and without faith it is impossible to please god because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who honestly seek him the bible teaches us that these are the two attitudes we should always have in approaching god respect for his person and faith in his power verse 19 jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples so what is what is jesus response to the ruler's request jesus agreed it did not matter who he was he was a person in need that was the only thing that mattered to jesus friend you may have resisted the lord all your life but if you will sincerely turn to jesus he will not turn the past against you he is willing to help you as well just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloth now before we find out what happens with the ruler's daughter a second miracle that took place on the way to the ruler's house this woman had spent all her money going to doctors but she was not getting any better this woman must have been very frustrated and tired she did not want to make a big scene and expose her problem so she decided that if she merely touched jesus she could be healed of course that is exactly what happened she touched his robe and immediately felt that she had been healed jesus turned and saw her take her daughter he said your faith has healed you the woman's approach was secretive and believing jesus response is both compassionate and reassuring 
take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. He does not reprimand her for sneaking up behind him. He does not rebuke her for a timid approach. Instead, he tells her, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. What a good news to those who are hurting. To those who are walking through pain or struggling in some area of life. Friend, you are not lost in the crowd before Jesus. He is intimate aware of your every single detail of your life. He knows your struggle because you are a child of God and Jesus is attentive to your deepest needs. When Jesus entered the synagogue, synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead but asleep, but they laughed at him. But they laughed at him. Notice the crowd's attitude before Jesus arrived. They are all mourning. After Jesus arrived, now they are all laughing at Jesus. The ruler was respectful and believing. The crowd is distrustful and disbelieving. <coughs> he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. <coughs> Jesus did exactly what the ruler asked him to do. Come and put your hand on her and she will leave. And exactly what the ruler believed he could do. Jesus went in, took the girl, took the girl by hand and she got up. The end results, the news of this spread through all that region. News of this spread through all that region. People went everywhere talking about Jesus' power over sick and death. Jesus' power over sicknesses and death. Friends, today we have seen two beautiful examples of faith. When the sick woman and the ruler were helpless and hopeless, Jesus was the answer. The woman came to Jesus and Jesus brought healing and peace. The ruler put his trust in Jesus and Jesus brought life. Where there was once was a death. Remember, in the kingdom of God, suffering ends, hearts are mended and new life takes the place of death. Friend, do you have faith as the student? Do you trust that Jesus' way is always the right way? When you are faced with a very difficult problem, will you bring it to Jesus? And will you walk with Jesus wherever he asks you to go? Do you trust that God's timing is perfect? Sometimes he always he allows delays so that he can learn more about him. Then he will receive more glory and your faith will grow stronger. Power over darkness. So far, we have looked at eight of these ten miracles, and now we come to the last two miracles the healing of the two blind men and the healing of the demon possessed man. There are no miracles recorded in the Old Testament of the blind receiving sight. In Isaiah chapter 29, verse 18, in the day the deaf will hear, words read from a book, and the blind will see through the gloom and darkness. The miracle of giving sight to the blind and giving speech to the silent were signs of that come with the Messiah. And so, this was a very powerful indicator that the kingdom of God has indeed come with Christ. Notice, in verses 27 through 30, five things about this miracle. First of all, son of David, have mercy on us. Notice that the two blind men following Jesus called him son of David. And this term, son of David, was a title for the Messiah. On the very first verse in Gospel of Matthew, 
he also called jesus the son of god secondly notice this is not a pub, public miracle when he had gone indoors the blind man the blind man came to him next then he touched them so notice jesus physical touch jesus touched their eyes before he healed them this has also been a common theme in these healings according to your faith let it be done to you fourthly notice the emphasis on the faith again according to your faith it will be done to you let it be done to you jesus responds to faith friends it is not just faith in god but faith in jesus that counts finally notice also jesus warning not to tell anyone see that no one don't tell anyone about this so jesus warning not to tell anyone part of the reason was jesus knew that as word spread it would hinder rather than help his ministry so those are some of the particulars of this particular healing miracle friends the healing of this blind man is the obvious picture of our own spiritual blindness every one of us are born blind with respect to the things of god by nature we cannot see the spiritual realm of god there are scales on our eyes so we do not see it it is not because there is something wrong with with our optical nerves it is because there is something wrong with our souls the sin of our hearts blinds us to the things of god until god opens the eyes of our hearts we cannot see them next but instead they went out and spread his fame all over the region see they spread the news about him so the focus of their message was jesus as the messiah rather than just their own healing friend these two blind men may have been physically blind but they saw the truth of jesus identity more clearly than all those around them this is a reminder to us this evening that we are also called to spread the news of jesus power and authority the demonic mute while they were going out a man who was demon possessed and could not talk was brought to jesus and when the demon was driven out the man who had been spoke it is the briefest account of all the miracles described we are given very little details of what went on there was a man who was mute which was caused by a demon jesus cast out the demon and the man is now able to speak but here is another important spiritual lesson for us those who are blind to the truth certainly cannot speak the truth and when christ opens your eyes he also opens your mouth to speak the truth of god in a dying world the crowd was amazed and said nothing like this has ever been seen in israel but the pharisees said it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons this passage ends this account by giving us two different reactions to jesus miracles the crowd's reaction the pharisees reaction the crowd's reaction was one of amazement the pharisees reaction was one of rejection and unbelief friends how will you respond to jesus miracles and power it is popular today to sit to sit on the fence and be non committal the world wants us to be accepting of all opinions jesus wants us to understand something if you are not with him completely then you are against him you cannot sit on the fence 
when it comes to Jesus. You cannot say you want to wait longer before you make a decision. Otherwise, remember, you are in a dangerous position. You are not with the Messiah. You are not with the king. You are still spending time with the strong man. He has already been overcome and substituted by Jesus. Friends, you are choosing the losing side. Jesus has the power over darkness. Jesus has power over spiritual darkness. Jesus has power over darkness in your life too. So, he is our final principle. Jesus, gracious authority, powerfully restores, brings new life for his people. Jesus, gracious authority, powerfully restores and brings new life for his glory. Dear friends, this passage teaches us Jesus has power over sickness and the death. This reminds us that again that Jesus is the only one worth following. Friend, if you are going to surrender your life to someone, certainly you should follow the man who can raise that debt. Jesus alone is worthy to be followed as the Lord and trusted as Savior. He has power over spiritual darkness. He has power over darkness in our life too. So, how will you respond to Jesus? Will you be amazed at his power and seek his power over the darkness in your own life? Or will you double down on the devil's deception and continue to prefer the darkness of life? Let's pray. Lord, you give life to the broken and hope to the desperate. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace, which you did not earn and do not deserve. This evening, I pray for anyone in this place who do not know as their Savior. Lord, through the study of the Matthew, the unexpected king, may they respond to you. Generous offer of life and hope. Lord, move us to hear your call and lead us into the fullness of life. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. So, thank you, friends. Class is dismissed. We are going to meet next week.